Hi, I'm Lisa Lazarus. I'm the museum director for the Nantucket Shipwreck and Lifesaving Museum, which is part of the Egan Maritime Institute. And Katie Castle is one of our docents. She's been with us for six years, right straight out of uh, her junior year of, co of high school and uh, came every summer all the way through college. And now she's graduated, but still works with her grandfather at the museum. Um, and she's my techie guru here. So, <laughs> so I was trying to think, how can I tie in our museum with this museum and then I thought well that's silly because all of the museums on Nantucket deal with the history of Nantucket in one fashion or another and of course we know about the Whaling Museum and this museum uh, talks about of course the baskets and the baskets came from the light ships and uh, the light ships were navigational aids which ties into our museum and I'm not going to get into anything about the light ships because I assume you all know about that and Karen talks about that and we don't really need to get into that, but obviously the light ships were woven on the light ships, the light ship baskets um, during their downtime. But they were navigational aids, the light ships were navigational aids out in the water to uh, direct ships away from the shoals, which is just another fancy word for sandbars. And that's what we talk about. We talk about all the shipwrecks around Nantucket and the life-saving efforts that took place to save the people off of the ships. Uh, this year we're celebrating 50 years uh, since the original piece of the building, uh, uh, the erection started at that time, and then 10 years since the renovation and add-on. So throughout our museum right now, we have for our exhibit this year 50 shipwreck stories. And if you have any inclination to do so, you can come in and count them all. Or not. <laughs> and you can read some. Two of the, two of the shipwrecks that we really focus on uh, throughout the year and, and in all years, not just this year. One is the H.P. Kirkham. That's a painting by Rodney Sharman of the H.P. Kirkham. It was a ship coming from, was it coming from Halifax? Mm -hmm. Going to New York with a, a cargo of fish in 1892. And uh, during the 17th and 18th century, or 18th and 19th centuries, about 250 ships passed by Nantucket every day. And the reason for that was because they were carrying cargo. We didn't have planes, we didn't have trains, we didn't have cars. Everything that anybody needed was transported by ship. And they were not coming to Nantucket. Nantucket was a shipping lane. So they were coming from Canada, from Europe, from South America, but they had to go past Nantucket to get other places. And of course, we have a lot of shoals around Nantucket. Are any of you sailors, mm -hmm. boaters? Mm -hmm. So you know how many shoals there are around Nantucket that you have to still maneuver today. This ship wrecked on the Rose and Crown Shoal 15 miles east of Nantucket in about seven feet of water. So when that ship wrecked, the men on board lit mattresses and put them up in the rigging and the lighthouse keeper at Sankety saw that and called the lifesavers at uh, Cascada Life Saving Station. They rowed out in an open boat in January in the wind and the storms and the snow. Uh, there were seven men on board. They rescued seven men off the ship. It took them 26 hours round trip in an open boat in January. Needless to say, they were heroes. They were awarded uh, medals. It made national news. Um, fast forward to 1956. You still have ships coming and going past Nantucket, not cargo ships per se. This is the Andrea Doria. It is an ocean liner. Um, and this is another ship that we talk about on Nantucket. Uh, this ship was considered a uh, state of the art for its time. It was uh, considered a floating art gallery. Um, it, Italy at that time, it was right after World War II, they um, were taking great pride in uh, producing a ship that was state of the art. And, and the, the best architects were employed, artists, ceramists, uh, textilists, um, this is an interior shot of the Andrea Doria in, in the early 1950s. It, its um, maiden voyage was 1953, and it, it sailed to New York. 
So these, this is what you're seeing. This is first class dining. They had first, second, and third class. Um, the dining rooms, everything was separate. Uh, dining rooms, reading rooms, uh, children's rooms, and um, there were three swimming pools, which was very unusual. Three swimming pools. And just, just a few interiors here. Is that the last of the interiors? Okay. This is Captain Calamai. He was the, um, the captain of the ship. This story has a lot of intrigue because a lot of Nantucket people are tied to the Andrea Doria, um, and several Nantucket people were on the ship in 1956. It was coming from Genoa, Italy to New York. I'm going to tell you all about the Andrew Doria. I hope you don't mind because no, no. this is a most, one of our most intriguing stories and then hopefully this will prompt you to want to come to the museum and read about all of our other wonderful shipwreck stories. But this, this one's got a lot, lot to it so this is what I'm going to focus on. Um, they were coming from Genoa, Italy to New York. It was the last night of, of their journey and everybody was dancing and drinking and having a grand old time. Captain Calamai had, had uh, the radar on. It showed that there was another ship coming from Sweden, I mean, excuse me, from New York going to Sweden called the Stockholm. It was about um, 14 nautical miles away. He figured, okay, you know, the radio's on, the, uh, everything's cool, no problem. And uh, didn't pay too much attention after that. And what happened was, the Andrea Doria was in fog, and when it came out of the fog, it saw the Stockholm's lights directly in front of it. The Stockholm hit the Andrea Doria. That's the, that's the bow of the Stockholm. Sliced open the uh, starboard side of the uh, Andrea Doria, um, like a can opener. And uh, we'll just leave it right there for a moment. Um, and the Andrea Doria started to sink. Um, so they put out the SOS, uh, and there were several ships in the area. The Stockholm, in fact, stayed afloat and took on about uh, a little over 500 of the passengers. There was another ship in the area. It was called the Ile de France. It was actually going to Europe, and on board was a life photographer because they were going to Europe for, a, for a, an assignment. And the captain of the Ile de France got the message that the Andrea Doria was in trouble and they thought it was a hoax. And he thought, that's ridiculous. This is a, you know, a huge ship. It's a beautiful ship. Um, it couldn't possibly be sinking. And captains had to, they had to um, be conscious of their schedule because if they strayed from their schedule at all, it cost the owners a lot of money. So they were very, very conscious of that, as was Captain Calamai. And that's why he was moving along at a good clip. Um, and uh, not too concerned, and of course he should have been. But the Ile de France t did eventually turn around. It took um, more than 700 of the passengers off the Andrea Doria. Um, and because there was a life photographer on board, a lot of really fabulous photos like this one were taken. I want to show them another picture. of This is the Andrea Doria starting to sink. And you can just show them another one. These are the life lifeboats being lowered with people on board. Um, I'm just trying to think where I'm at with my thoughts here. <laughs> um, the, there were a lot of uh, passengers on board. Some were uh, famous people. A, a, an actress named Ruth Roman was on board. There were um, very wealthy uh, people on board. And then there were immigrants on board as well. And they were in the lower hold. And, a lot, of, a lot of the people in the lower hold didn't make it. But because it hit on the starboard side, top to bottom, it affected anybody in all of those cabins. And um, what's next? This is an interesting story. This is a, a Hungarian, two Hungarian refugees. They were ballet dancers. They were slated to stay in a cabin on the starboard side, which was where it got hit. But the uh, cabin had a shower and a bathtub, so they felt that was a bit too excessive, and they switched cabins and went to the port side. That decision saved their life. Had they stayed in the cabin that they were in, they would have perished. And in fact, and I just have to uh, look at my notes here, there was a doctor and his wife in that cabin, um, and the wife perished, but the doctor lived 
in the cabin next to his, and I think you can go to the next one. Okay. In the cabin next to his was um, a mother and her, or a woman and her husband. He was a, a New York correspondent living in Madrid with his wife and his two stepchildren. Uh, this is Linda Morgan. She was one of them. Um, the other child was in her bunk with Linda, her sister. She was eight years old. She perished. But Linda lived, and she was considered the miracle girl because when the Stockholm hit the Andrea Doria and then pulled back, she was knocked out and pulled back onto the bow of the Stockholm. And if you remember that slide of the Stockholm all mushed, it's a miracle that she lived. But when they were looking for her, her biological father in New York was the uh, uh, famous newscaster uh, um, Edward P. Morgan. I don't know if that name rings a bell. That was her biological father. When he was looking for her, and they were looking for her from the passenger list on the Andrea Doria and, and couldn't find her, they had assumed that she had perished because they weren't thinking that she was on the Stockholm. She survived. She was in a New York hospital for three months in full body cast. And uh, she um, is still alive today. She lives in Texas. Her name is Linda Hardberger. Her husband was a mayor in Texas. And I spoke with her on the phone a few years ago. I was all excited because I had tried to locate her. I wanted to see if she wanted to share any stories. And I didn't hear back. I had sent her a little note. And I didn't hear back for several months. And, and then there was a call in the office. And somebody said, there's some woman on the phone named Linda Hardberger. And I went, <laughs> I felt like it was like Meryl Streep calling me. So, I chatted with her. She's in her 70s now. And um, she said, you know, I was on Nantucket a few years ago. And I said, well, Linda, why didn't you come to the museum? And she said, well, I try to stay away from those shipwreck mu museums and anything having to do with shipwrecks. And she said it took her a long time, but she and her husband still now spend a lot of time on the water, but she always has to have land in sight. Yeah. So uh -huh. anyway, so she was, she was a survivor. She was a, the miracle girl. Sadly, her, her mother, who did live, um, suffered from a lot of depression. As you can imagine, she lost her husband and her other child in the crash. And she um, lived another 10 years, and then she passed away. But anyway, um, what's next? I don't know what's next. Oh, this is a happy story. Um, this is a woman who, who was carrying her child. Her name was Liliana Donner. And she had placed her two-year-old Maria on her shoulders. And she began to climb down from sea deck, which was where the immigrants were, to safety. And her daughter slipped and fell into the ocean. She dove in, got her, saved her, brought her back on board, in, and put her in a lifeboat. And then the other woman there also fell into the ocean. So she dove back in, got her, saved her as well. And so that's, that's um, you know, a wonderful, happy story. Um, not so much the next one. Hope you don't mind if I, I have to tell you the good and the bad because, you know, it, it wasn't all happy. This is kind of a sad story. This is a, a husband and wife immigrants coming to America to start over with all the worldly goods. They had a four-year-old daughter. The husband was panicked. He dropped his four-year-old into the lifeboat. She hit her head on the gunwale um, and was knocked out. She was then put onto the Stockholm. They were put onto the Ile de France. So for two days, these frantic parents were looking for their four-year-old. And eventually, uh, she was located in a Boston hospital after first being taken to the Nantucket Cottage Hospital. And you have to realize the Andrea Doria um, was sinking 45 miles south of Nantucket, near the Nantucket Lightship. So the first place they took this child was to the Nantucket Cottage Hospital, as they did a lot of the people who were injured. And then they located her in, um, in a Boston hospital. But unfortunately, she never gained consciousness, and she passed away. And I feel so sorry for those parents, because they didn't know the language. They lost all their belongings. And then their poor child dies. And they were probably thinking, why did we ever make this trip? So that was a, a sad story. But there are other happy ones. These, this is the Palladino family. And they um, were also immigrants coming to ne ne um, America. The husband was a tailor. And they were a little bit more careful about putting all their children into lifeboats. The, the oldest one, though, was separated from her parents. And they didn't find her for several days. Um, and she was fortunately safe. I'll go to the next one. In the arms of a Red Cross uh, nurse. And they did locate her. And then they all 
went to New York. And as you saw in the other picture, they were all thanking, thanking God for their, their survival. So that was a happy story. Um, and then this is Ruth Roman, who was on board. She was a, evidently a, um, a, an actress from the, the 30s and 40s, and she was on board with her little boy, who she was separated from. She's in New York now, waiting to see um, if she can find her son, which she did. So that was another lovely reunion. He's still alive today, her son. And um, this, is the, this gives you an indication of the beauty of the ship. This was the chapel in the, in the, uh, on the ship. It was uh, non-denominational. Anybody could attend. Um, there, was another, there were two families that are associated with Nantucket. One were the Thoreaus, or I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly. They um, were uh, second or third cousins of Lucille Hayes. Does anybody know Lucille Hayes? Her, she's here on Nantucket. Um, they were her parents' second or third cousins. They were in a cabin just next to the cathedral, a very um, beautiful cabin, uh, first class. Their son was down the hall. He, uh, they perished because it w they were in the direct line of the hit. Their son lived. He came out of his cabin as the, as the boat was tilting, kind of wondering what was going on, went back to sleep then got up again when he realized things were a little bit off and looked for his parents, couldn't find them, got into a lifeboat and um, obviously then was informed that his parents had perished. He was raised by a sister in San Francisco and I believe he is a big um, newscaster now in San Francisco, but he's related to Lucille Hayes here in Nantucket. The other family that was on Nantucket, which, and I didn't, I didn't put this on a PowerPoint, but I'm gonna show it to you were the Giffords, the Gifford family. Um, this is Bambi Gifford Malesko. You know the Malesko family? Here, I'll hold it up. Oh, sorry. Does anybody know the Malesko family? Bambi Malesko. Well, she was on board with her parents and her three brothers. And um, this is the moment when they, they were separated from dad, and they were on the Ile de France, and they came around the corner, and there was dad. And so they were all reunited on the rescue ship. But it's interesting, you'll see two things here. I believe mom is holding a light ship basket. <laughs> and the interesting thing about that is that as they were climbing the stairs to get into the lifeboat, she dropped her light ship basket. And she said, oh, don't worry about it, just, just let it go. Bambi scurried away, went down the stairs, got the light ship basket and brought it back to her mother. And you can see that mom's holding her hands like this. She's a, she had taken her wedding band off when she went to sleep so that when the ship was hit, she didn't have time to get it. So she's, she's hiding her hand because she didn't have her, her wedding band on. But at any rate, um, all the boys are still living and, and Bambi lives on Nantucket and she's, her daughter is A.J. Malesko, who went on to become a, an Olympian hockey player. So, so that's another Nantucket connection. Um, the ship was hit on the 25th of July, 1956. It took 10 hours, or 11 hours, 11 hours, right? Yeah, 11 hours to sink. So it didn't sink until the morning of the 26th. And the reason it took that long was because it was built differently and had different um, compartments that were closed, unlike the Titanic which sunk in two and a half hours. So fortunately, because it took that much longer to sink and there were that many more ships around to take on the survivors, there were less people who perished. Of the 1,700 plus on the, on the ship, 46 perished and five on the Stockholm, which you could say is not a lot, but for those who lost somebody, it's certainly more than, more than we care to think about. Is there anything else? I'm just, and these are just people in New York uh, after the ship arrived, or the, actually not the ship, but the other ships arrived with survivors waiting to see who was going to get off of a lifeboat and who wasn't. And that, obviously you can see there are people here who are just ecstatic to see their relatives. And of course there were those who stood there alone waiting and nothing happened. 
So um, I think that's it. But I, uh, you know, again, this is one of the stories we tell in the museum. We have a beautiful uh, ship model of the Andrea Doria that shows the three uh, swimming pools. And, you know, it was, it was just exquisite. And sadly, it still lies at the bottom of the ocean, 45 miles south of Nantucket. Uh, to date, 17 divers have, have perished diving the Andrea Doria. Uh, and these are experienced divers. This is not a recreational dive. Mm. Uh, we have some of the artifacts that came up from the Andrea Doria on display at the museum. Um, it's very murky it, waters, very cold, lots of currents, lots of uh, debris and uh, netting. And I saw a YouTube video of a diver who had gone into the Andrea Doria and everything, of course, is on its side. And so you get all disoriented. And um, so I think at this point it's deteriorated so much that uh, I don't think anybody's allowed to dive on it anymore. Um, so at any rate. Um, so anyway, I hope you come out to the museum. We've got lots of other shipwreck stories. Some are happy, some not so much. But um, I tried to choose the ones that were a little bit more intriguing rather than shipwrecked on such and such a date, you know. So, yes? And so where did the lifeboats take the people? Did they take them to the other two ships or? Yes, or yes, they took them to the larger <laughs> ships, to the Ile de France and the Stockholm and, um, yeah. And there were a few other Coast Guard vessels in the area as well. And some people were transported to, to the Nantucket Cottage Hospital and then from there to either Boston or New York for, for medical attention. But all of the ships then took the survivors to New York because that was the destination. That's where the relatives were waiting or friends for anybody that was going to show up. So, yes. What happened to the captain? Was a lawsuit brought against uh -oh. him? Did he lose his license? Do they think he was? He was a broken. No, he was a broken man, and to this day they haven't determined whose fault it was—if it was the Stockholm or the Andrea Doria. But there were a lot of, there was a lot of uh, intrigue and, and lawsuits that sprang up. Mm -hmm. But um, he was truly a broken man. He, you know, I don't think he went back out to sea. So, he was a very kind man. That's what I was. That's what I. Um, determined from all the reading that I've done and he really uh, felt um, responsible for you know for everybody and the ship and in fact he didn't want to get off the ship at the end he, he was the last one to get off the ship and the few crew members that had stayed behind with him uh, threatened to stay with him if he didn't get off the ship and that's the only reason he got off otherwise he would have gone down with his ship that's how responsible he felt so, and I guess the, the captain of the Stockholm was a bit more stoic and matter of fact and uh, different, different personality. So, anyway. I, Did I, I talk long I enough? I read a book about <laughs> the uh, Andrea Doria. Yeah. And, and I know that the book went chapter after chapter about what happened and what mistakes were made and why did the Andrea Doria turn right into the path of the. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody really yeah. can, can figure it out yeah. why it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, ships will pass port to port, basically like cars. You pass left, you know, your left side passes right. their left side. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, the captain determined that they were going to pass starboard to starboard, yeah. and uh, uh, it didn't work out too well, obviously. <laughs> so when the, the Stockholm was coming, and you know, you, you, these are huge ships. They, they can't just stop and back up quickly. So, um, yeah, it was in inevitable at, at that point. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just just a little just a little taste of what we talk about at the museum. If we didn't have the story of whaling, um, the story of life saving would be the story on Nantucket because there were so many heroic people that uh, went out to save all of these people, whether it was in 1892 or 1956 or whatever. And as a matter of fact, we did honor um, a gentleman uh, two years ago. Every um, year on 9-11, we have what we call Lifesavers Recognition Day, where we honor um, two or three people who have saved a life on Nantucket in that year. And in 2016, it was 60 years since the Andrea Doria had uh, sunk. So we had an exhibit about the Andrea Doria. And we decided to make an exception and honor a gentleman who was in his 20s at the time. 
young guy who put a child on his back, went down the rope ladder, put the child on a lifeboat, went back, got another child, put that child on his back. He did it, I think, 12 times. And until one of the crew members said, enough, you're exhausted, you have to get into a lifeboat yourself. He's still alive today, he's in his 80s, and we brought him from Florida and we honored him. Oh, nice. Yeah, because, That's you know, so cool. yeah. So that was two years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. How does uh, Joshua James connect to the museum? Oh. Because my parents lived in one of his houses. Really? In yeah. Hull? Was yeah. it in Hull? It was, yeah. Yeah. Hull. Joshua James was a, um, a giant of a lifesaver. Yeah. When he, do you know the story of Joshua James a little bit? You want to tell them? Um, yeah, I, I can't even remember exactly uh, when he lived, but I remember he saw the transition from volunteer life saving to the professional life saving. And he was a volunteer. He started as a volunteer when he was 15. Um, his father had been a volunteer life saver before him, and I think his, at least his mother and maybe his sister had died on a shipwreck. Mm -hmm. um, so he, it was just like all like in every part of his life yeah. and he was a lifesaver until he was 75 years old mm -hmm. which was um sort of past the age of retirement but uh he had been around for so long that no one really expected him to retire and stop doing it and he died um just not not of any accident or incident just sort of p passed away randomly as he like during a training session as he was training some new mm -hmm. uh lifesavers so he was you know involved with lifesaving from pretty much beginning to end, and there's a Coast Guard cutter uh, named after him, the Joshua James. Mm -hmm. And I think he, he's on like all the Coast Guard entrance exams. You have to know oh, all about who Joshua James is. Mm -hmm. And I believe he was buried in a casket that was shaped like a lifeboat. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> in Hull. In Hull. Yeah. And, that's, and we honor him in our museum because he was such a great lifesaver, even though he was from Hull. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. He was the most decorated lifesaver. He had the most wow. amount of uh, medals awarded. Um, so he lived in Hull, but he came here. He, no, we well, just we honored just, him because he, I mean, he um, yeah. saved people here, around here, or everywhere. Probably more um, locally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we still honor him yeah. because yeah. he was a giant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not physically, but <laughs> yeah. no, he wasn't. Yeah, yeah. What's Dick Max? Uh, I know he served on the light ship for how many years? I think it was just three months. Oh, that's all. Yeah, because normally I think most men only stayed on a light ship for three to six months. Think about it, that you're out in the water anchored. You're not going anywhere. That's a tough, tough time, a tough life. And that's why there was some downtime, and that's when they started weaving and doing other things. But there were a lot of chores that they had to accomplish on a daily basis. Um, but, and they were small boats. I mean, we have one story where a, a big ocean liner, it was a sister ship to the Titanic, sliced the, uh, what was it, the 1932? 30, uh, 34. 34 light ship in half because it was teeny tiny next to these huge uh, boats. So it was a dangerous position, too. Um, so yeah, so he was, he was on board, I think it was three months. Yeah, but he was yeah. on some other light ships as well. It wasn't just the Nantucket. Um, they'd do work, they'd be sent to different ones around. And he was only in the Coast Guard for four years, so part mm -hmm. of that was in Japan. He was in Japan for mm -hmm. a couple of years. Yeah. And we have some wonderful docents. Dick Max, one of them. Yeah. Katie's another. Uh, Chuck Allard, who used to work at the NHA, is another. And uh, my husband does it in the off season when I tell him he has to. Yeah. <laughs> um, my son's here this summer. He's a teacher, so he's doing it as well. And he did it in 2014, so we uh, re-employed him for this summer. And they're all great. They're all really wonderful docents. And then uh, Renee Coleman works behind the front desk. Um, she, her husband runs the casino. So, yeah. So come on out. I know a lot of you have, but um, and if you haven't seen the new exhibit this year, please make a point of. Uh, doing that as well. Is the Rodney Sharnin painting, is that in your collection? Yes, and it is on display in the museum right now. Yeah. yeah. You commissioned him to do that? or? Well, Bud Egan, who started the Egan Maritime Institute, commissioned him to paint that's many right. paintings. Right. And a lot of them you can see at the um, police station. Yeah. Um, the, 
on Fairgrounds Road. If you go into the hallways, up and down, and into the community room are all the Rodney Sharman yeah, paintings that are on loan. School, I think, yes, right? and yeah. those are the paintings that are now uh, on Fairgrounds. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot in our storage facility as well, but the Nantucket story is displayed at the um, Fairgrounds facility. Yeah, yeah. But this, this particular painting is uh, in the museum right now on display. And the, yeah. the British Queen. And the British Queen, too, which is another one which is ties to the Mooney family. So that painting oh. as well. The, yeah, the Rodney Sherman painting. Mm -hmm. yeah. This isn't even the only Kirkham painting. He did like a, another yeah, painting another. of the same shipwreck, like more of a... A dramatic. Oh, it's okay. Of like the, yeah, just like this area. Yeah. But um, yeah, and the British Queen is another great story. So I'm not going to tell you anything about that. You have to come out and see it. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.